Um, so welcome to everyone who's grabbed a sandwich or whatever time of day it is for you and you're, you're joining us. I see that there are a few international people who are with us. So it's fantastic to have everyone here today. And we've got our two presenters, Mark Pierce and Ron Howell. And the reason why they're here is because they, they are long-term licensees. So I decided that it was, would be nice to have a, a fairly informal session. Basically, this is a recruitment drive for licensee. Why should you, why should you do it? Why should you become a licensee? And so I thought how best to find out whether you want to be a licensee is to hear from two people who have done it for quite a long time. And so that's why these two gentlemen are here. So they're going to have 10 minutes to speak each, and then we'll have 10 minutes discussion time. So we'll, we'll try and keep to time. Uh, gentlemen, you listening? So I've asked uh, both Mark and Ron to tell us what it's like to be a licensee. As I said, they've done it for quite a long time. And I don't want, you know, I, I want to hear both sides, the good and the bad, because if anyone's contemplating becoming a licensee, you really want to know what you're getting into. So it's all very well to read the, the information and, and sign up online and get involved and things like that. But there's nothing better than hearing it from the people that have been there and done that. So, Mark, I'm going to let you go first for your 10 minutes and uh, tell us what it's like being a licensee. Thank you. So um, I'm the, one of the licensees for the coronation down in Plymouth, which that uh, founded in 1691. So a good time ago. Um, she was a uh, um, British man of war, very interesting ship to look at. And as you can see on the screen here, we've got a slide and it just shows two areas hatched in red there and there. And when I joined uh, looking into the coronation, pretty much everything that we knew about the coronation were in these two areas that I've marked around in blue with my awful very rubbish circles. There was a little bit of stuff in the middle, but that was it. So uh, I was interested in the coronation because for me, I wanted to add value to my diving. Um, I've been diving at that point for around 10 years and I'd seen and dived most things that I wanted to and certainly from Plymouth, um, plenty of diving had been done around. But there was this one wreck that wasn't allowed and that was the coronation. So when you couple that with my very natural desire that if someone says I'm not allowed to go somewhere, then I want to go, um, that was a dive target that I was determined to see. So my interest was peaked. Why couldn't I go there? What would I see there that I wouldn't see in other places? And so the coronation was the, the likely target. And in my mind, because I'm not an ac academic at all, uh, I'm the man off the street, uh, on the seabed, underneath these red lines on the, on the charts, was a pir Pirates of the Caribbean style ship, laying upright on the seabed, it's probably still full of sail, a um, bit tattered maybe, but uh, led there, waiting for me to dive, probably some gold treasure lying around, guns all at the ready. So as you would imagine, the very naive idea. And actually, as we get people visiting, it's very much the idea that a lot of people do expect from a wreck like the coronation, they do expect to see a lot more of the wreck than there is actually there. So when we go back to 2008, I, there was a chance meeting with myself and the uh, senior licensee, Ginge Crook, um, at Bobbisan, I happened to be diving there that afternoon. And I'm, I didn't know who he was, but we started talking about this wreck that I wanted to see. And uh, he didn't let on that he was the licensee. And so when we got chatting, I was very enthusiastic about it. And he invited me to dive it, which was huge uh, for me. And I was very grateful for him to do so. Of course, the project as we have now with the diver trail, everything else wasn't there at that time. Uh, but that was something then all my naive enthusiasm uh, was able to be channeled with Green, you know, Ginge into actually developing that trail between us. So it was probably not without many sighs um, and the odd chuckle that this enthusiastic uh, youngster, as it were, completely unknowledgeable, uh, constantly bugging him with naive ideas and discoveries and theories about the wreck. But from that, 
somehow Ginge was able to mould me into something of a, a half decent amateur underwater archaeologist. And that's something that um, I've never forgotten, really, and really appreciated. And from a licensee point of view, uh, particularly those from the academic background, I've always appreciated the way that Ginge helped me to see these things. He was never derogatory towards my ideas. Uh, he never looked down upon me. Um, he was honest and kind, but always trying to infuse and always trying to help me to enjoy what I could with the skills I had available. So something really to take away from uh, the conversation today is please be kind with people like me. Uh, we don't know things from the academic point of view, but we have the enthusiasm when channeled right that would really help with projects. So it is really a gift uh, diving on wrecks like the coronation. And, and as we see this opening slide, this was what it was like really when uh, I first started diving there. But then if we just move on to the next slide, over the next few years, uh, we managed to find all these other things. So um, sorry, it's not too detailed, but uh, this gives you an idea. So we have the two sites as we had before here and here. But then as we started to dive, we found all this wreckage all the way along here. These different targets, items that were clearly of the uh, period. And it was in the most peculiar wrecking fashion. Because when we think that from here, where she wrecked, right the way out to here is 1,500 meters. So we like to claim that we have the longest wreck site protected wreck in the country and please if you know of a longer one let us know but it is really quite remarkable and we don't really know fully why this has happened in the way it did whether she was dragged out whether the the storm dragged her in it's very very difficult but we can see and we can actually see a golden line there really and if i just draw it in Basically, that is the line of the wrecking. If we go 20 metres that side or 20 metres that side of that line, there is virtually nothing. And when you think that over the period we've now dived 30,000 square metres of wreck site all the way up this line trying to identify items, it just gives you an idea of what a remarkable wreck site she is. But we found loads of things over the time. Uh, and loads of things down here that were really of the period. And we can see a few here in the picture. But how do we tie them in to the coronation? How can we be sure that they are of the coronation? Well, if we take, for instance, our uh, kettle handle here, we can see it here. This was found a good 1,400 metres from the main part of the wreck. So how do we tie that in? Well, we've done lots of research, and this is one from the Invincible, and we can see very, very similar kettle handle there. And there's another one picture there to show that handle again. So if we go back to ours, we can see that it is of contemporary makeup. And then this is the one from Stirling Castle, and it's even more pronounced there that we can see our kettle handle. So part of my role has also been uh, research in trying to identify these objects and trying to pull them into the coronation as such and making sure that we're not just finding more and more wreckage that belong to other ships along the way. And when we do find things, obviously, we go through the standard surveying techniques here. We've got a lovely sounding lead um, from the period again. And again, this one was found maybe five, six hundred metres from the wreck site, but exactly contemporary with vessels of the time. So being a licensee is a mixture of showing people around the wreck, uh, but also the ultimate pleasure and privilege of finding different artifacts like this and enjoying then uh, bringing them uh, where possible uh, to be shown for other people to have a full benefit from. So that is sadly my 10 minutes up. So I'm not going to hog and take someone else's 10 minutes, but thank you for the privilege of uh, being a licensee and also for the way that um, academics and a shout out to Dan Pasco 
Alison James, Mark James, people like that, the way that they help us is so much appreciated. So I can't leave without thanking um, the uh, academics amongst us that are so good to help us along. Thank you very much, Mark. That was uh, really interesting and brilliant and nice little summary to your rec site and to your experience. So now we'll move on to Ron. Thank you also very much for keeping to time, Mark. That's much appreciated. So Ron, if you could uh, share your presentation, please. That would be great. Then share screen. We can hear you, so that's good. Yeah, you can hear me. Yep, and it looks like we're almost able to see your screen. Yep, we can see your screen. Oh, if you just put it in presentation mode, we'll be ready to go. Right. Fantastic. Okay. Right. Southwest Maritime Archaeological Group. Um, 34 years of adventure. Why would we do it? Off we go. It all started in 1989 when a spear fisherman spot several cannon in the Erm estuary. He mentioned it to fellow divers from Bigby Bay in South Devon who then talked to friends from Northampton BSAC, which I was part of. <clears throat> we were then busy searching for an armada wreck off the west coast of Scotland, uh, and, and later we decided to meet up in the Urm to take a look. And between 1989 and 1995, we had located a 17th century galleon and 46 Bronze Age tin ingots. Uh, in 1990, the galleon site was given protected wreck status, the first for the team, and a second protected wreck status followed in 1992 for the tin ingot site. Within weeks of the protection order being published in the proprietary newspapers, the site was looted. That, coupled with the Lord of the Manor issue, which is another issue completely, we started to learn about archaeological diving. In 1990, we merged into the Southwest Maritime Archaeological Group with our method sta statement, History from the Sea. And then we went on to win the 1993 Duke of uh, Edinburgh Gold Medal Award. Uh, and that was a, a really, really good day for us. Uh, members of the team who were not members of the Nautical Archaeological Society joined up and gained their NAS Part 2 qualification. And then the big weekend. Weekend 28th, 29th of April, 1995. The sea conditions were bad in the Urm. We'd come down from Northampton, so uh, we had to get some diving in. And the trip around from Urm to a boring cannon site off Solcombe uh, was pretty rough, believe you me. We shouldn't be here now. Quite the opposite to being boring, it soon would prove to be a life changer for a few of us. Gold. And there's a picture taken of silly men with gold, extremely excited silly men. And this is what you do. Um, it was an incredible moment captured on camera by uh, uh, one of the uh, team's wives who had just turned up in a boat with his sandwiches and a camera. <clears throat> Once we calmed down, a discussion took place about the enormity of the find and what was on the bottom. And it was decided to include the rest of the team of 13 who were absent that weekend. There were only five of us there that uh, on that day. So uh, here we are discussing at my house in Northampton um, and some of the uh, gold coins on the table and with a tin of beer this is how we discuss things the receiver veronica robbins a lovely lady and she said to us due to the enormity of the diving carry on diving but the site but tell no one and she meant no one um so every future dive brought up coins and jewelry <clears throat> happy boys more coins and this is a, a selection of what we were finding gold ingots jewelry um, dinar coins, all from North Africa. The receiver of again, um, we, we, we consulted her and she said, we'll get a protection order on the site, a third for the team. And the receiver of REC then called a meeting in Northampton in 1996. And those attending were us, the diving team reps, the government's archaeological diving unit, Martin Dean, the receiver of REC, Phoenicia Porter of the British Museum's Coin and Metal Department, Angela Cape Evans, a Viking coin, coin expert from the British Museum. Why a Viking coin expert? We didn't know. I think they assumed we'd found a Viking wreck. A maritime lawyer. No one apart from the receiver had any idea what we had found. And that is another story. <clears throat> the press conference of the British Museum 1997 became celebs for a day. And the world's press were there. 
and also there was an American collector who offered us two and a quarter million dollars for the fines. We couldn't sell because we're English. Uh, we had to go through the system and eventually sold to the British Museum for £100,000 or just less than 100000 And uh, these two are displays over the years at the BM. And if you go there, hopefully pre-COVID, uh, this is the uh, museum display. Then I assume in the money gallery, it's they're still there. And at the back of that photograph is a, a, um, a case with some of our Bronze Age stuff in. So what is the wreck? Conclusions to date, and she's either a Barbary pirate or an English or Dutch merchantman. The clues, uh, a merchant seal with an M and a reversed R and a diamond, pewter bowl with an M and an R, and a Dutch Baroque pipe of about 1620. However, all the uh, merchant seal marks and the pewter bowl marks were destroyed in the Great Fire of London. And if anybody out there now can help us with uh, that, those marks, please let, let me know. Right. OK, this is the problem then. How do they protect our protected wreck? They cannot do so, so we did it ourselves. After the lessons learned in the UM estuary, we set up a site security watch involving the secretary of the Gower Rock Hotel, watching from her office window. Later, we comply, compiled a comprehensive site security document, which now has been adopted for all UK protected sites. And this is uh, the front page of our 2023 uh, uh, brochure. Then eight years later, in 2003, things became very, very serious. We jumped from the 17th century into the Bronze Age. And uh, happy divers, there's, uh, there's Jim holding a pulse dive axe head, or two of them, and me recording and, uh, and the rest of the lads laughing. Work continued, surveying, ma measuring, tagging, and laying 100 meter lines, the hard work of archaeology, underwater archaeology. And again, another picture of happy chappies, this time with something to be happy about, gold, uh, Bronze Age gold, incredible finds. In 2004, an object was found between a rapier and a spearhead. This object here, which we stuck on our noses, thought it was a Roman helmet, but no, this was the first um, object of archaeological importance. Uh, a paper was published by Dr. Stuart Needham of the British Museum, and he stated that the Sicilian object, that object from Sulcum, is therefore the first secure object of Mediterranean origin and Bronze Age date to be found in Northwest Europe. So our little team had proved trade between the Mediterranean and Northern Europe in the Bronze Age. And then we find a second Bronze Age wreck, which we have called the Bronze Age Trader. And this is what we started to find, tin ingots, copper ingots, and also more gold. Uh, another picture of uh, one weekend's finds. Uh, it was just absolutely incredible and how lucky we've been. Um, and now 21, 2021 diving season is the underwater chart of the area. Two protected areas, the uh, Moore Sands protected area found in 1979 and the Gold Wreck or Cannon site and uh, Bronze Age site on the, on the left. The 17th century wreck site we found in 95, pretty well adjacent to a Bronze Age wreck site found in 2003, and now the new found Bronze Age trading vessel, which we, we think is part of the Moore Sands finds as well. We, we, we're to prove this in, in the future. Valuation day at the British Museum, Museum which was a, a real shocker to the British Museum once it was all put together. Right, and uh, coming to the end of my quick chat is uh, the picture of our sites. This is uh, on the left there, on the top of the hill there, is a Bronze Age and Iron Age uh, field system. And this is where our Bronze Age wrecks were probably dallying with. We're, we're, we're not sure. And uh, we've also got a nice blue plaque there overlooking our sites. Uh, thank you, Ali and uh, English Heritage. Uh, there it is, um, our own blue plaque. And team's achievements, the richest find of Islamic gold in Northern Europe. We proved that trade occurred between the Mediterranean and Europe in the Bronze Age. One of the most important maritime discoveries, discoveries of the Bronze Age in the world and licensees of four protected wreck sites. Not bad for a team of advocational divers. And also another trip to the palace. So this is why we do it. This is why we did it. This picture shows you 
the friendship, companionship, sheer adventure we've had over 34 years in a one picture. Thank you, um, Ali and everybody else, History from the Sea and working with all these people. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ron. That was brilliant. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite overwhelmed. I was madly scribbling down questions <laughs> that I'm, I'm going to, uh, to have to ask you. Um, but I'm, I'm going to ask Mark one first while I just uh, recover myself. Um, so, uh, Mark, thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you to both of you for keeping to time. Please remember that this is now when everyone else gets to ask them questions, not just me. So please start to write your questions in the chat or the Q&A and we'll, we'll get them um, asked of these very experienced gentlemen. So, Mark, um, it's it's just brilliant that you have the the longest um the rec site. Um, we'll be interested to hear if someone else has uh, a, a longer rec site. Um, but uh, have you kind of, and and it's wonderful that you're working on on all the artifacts. But um, I understand that you're you're doing other things to to make it quite a unique site. Um, in regards to making it a, a marine life um protected area. Unofficially, yeah, I believe. That's right, unofficially, of course, because we can't, we've got no jurisdiction really. But we thought we would take what is already there, which is the protected rec act, which means that there's no potting, allegedly no potting, um, no fishing on the site. Then when we decided we were going to have um, the uh, dive rec tour as well, it came very apparent that it was quite easy for divers just to help themselves to whatever sea life was there as well. And so we decided right back at the start that we would make it a complete no-take zone and a condition of people diving the dive trail that no sea life was to be disturbed. So lobsters, crawfish, so on and so on, even down to a scallop, none of it was to be touched. And what's happened, we've found since then, and divers have entirely respected that, we've got so much in the way of sea life there, because apart from illegal potting, which is darned annoying, and I think many sites get frustrated with that, um, we've got this real rich tapestry now of all this sea life that happily lives there. So from our point of view, and the, the thing we would like to put out to other um rec projects like ourselves other licensees is how about if you haven't already done so making it environmentally secure as well from the point of view that divers don't think of it as their own fiefdom that is just there for them to take what they find but actually say you know let's leave it all leave the sea life allow it the privilege of living there uh, undisturbed by us so you're protecting the marine life as well as the heritage and and of course we're we're more aware of, of them working hand in hand these days. So thanks very much for sharing that um, in, information with us. And it'd be interesting to hear if there's any other licensees and protected recs that are, are doing a similar thing. Um, I, I've got a, a question for Ron, um, and then we've got some questions from uh, other participants. Um, Ron, you've got some really sexy archaeology there, some very <laughs> sexy sites. You kind of, uh, you know, can't, can't really top it. Um, for protected recs, I think you're kind of, you know, just very high achievers there. Um, and I'm wondering, you got the, the first kind of main site that you worked on, there was lots of gold. Now, as much as we like to admit it, gold is kind of rather intrinsically sexy, and that's going to be a great incentive for divers of any persuasion to uh, investigate further, and that's going to be fantastic. But you also had the Bronze Age, um, the, sorry, the, the Sicilian artifact that was like groundbreaking discovery as well. So what what have you found personally more rewarding is it that kind of you know intrinsically amazing discovery of all of that gold that obviously got you a celebrity status for at least a day or was <laughs> it that ac more academic kind of discovery of finding the earliest evidence of mediterranean trade i mean what a hard what, one hey, yeah, we, what we were doing we were a team of normal blokes and we we were thrown into the world of archaeology mm -hmm. and uh, the team became individually experts in there i'm amazed at what we've got inside of us all of us when push comes to shove and when we started to find the, the bronze age stuff well I, I, I think we just couldn't believe what we were finding it, it was just 
I, when I do some talks to some of the ladies' groups and I say, I understand now how a, a woman can kiss a man with a beard and it's horrible. And this is what we were doing all the time. We were coming up with stuff and it was just, it was just a joy. Uh, and there's no one time. I think one time was that, yeah, because well, one thing we do, we used to wind ourselves up. And uh, Mick Carty was in the, he, he, he came over to me when I was all chuffed that I'd found a sword and he, he found something else. He said, hold your hand out, Ron. He dropped in this, this monstrous gold um, um, bracelet from the Bronze Age. And I just, it was just amazing. You know, the whole thing was a, <clears throat> a huge adventure, you know. Well, you, you've really got a, a great collection of, of, um, of heritage down there. You are very lucky and I'm sure there's lots of other um, oh. people that are very envious and hopefully we're going to want to come and help you out um, mm -hmm. because obviously we do need to have a succession kind of plan and you've been doing it for a very long time and um, it would be great to have the next generation because I'm sure there's lots of other uh, rec sites out there. You've got, you said that you've got four protected recs um, under your kind of uh, custodianship, but I'm wondering how many other recs have you dived to get to those four really significant recs, Ron? Well, do you want a list? <laughs> Just a ra rough number would be good. Well, again, it was the Urania in uh, off, off the Isle of Mole, and then the uh, Holswell, and then we found HMS Primrose on the Manacle Reef, um, and then I dived on the Goodwin Sands on the Admiral Gardner. So yeah, I mean, it's just it, it, it was it was a it was a, a build up, and uh, this this was a, a big crescendo, and I think this was the jackpot uh, when we went to. Uh, the um, estuary, we did not know what was in the future and how mm. we were going to change history. Just an ordinary, um, what I'm trying to get over is just an ordinary bunch of blokes who enjoy life and enjoy each other. Well, and I can see it through your pictures. It's not, yeah, it's not serious archaeology. That's just that's just people working. And the, the best thing about it was honesty. Honesty. Nobody was putting yep. stuff up their, up their sleeves. It was, it's been a, an incredible journey. Well, you've been, you've been very lucky. You've been a very lucky bunch of ordinary people ordinary blokes yeah. and i i you both met both of you both mark and ron have made some really lovely little statements in your in your presentations um so mark i really liked your one please be kind to us and i i hope that we are i hope this is a supportive environment that you you come to and, and presented to yeah. and i'm hoping that other people can be um help you know be kind and be helpful and if anyone is interested in getting involved with either of these projects then please either write in the chat or have a think about it and email nas and then we can pass things on um, so sorry, Mark, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, in, in the main, um, the academics within archaeology, underwater archaeology, have been great. And some of them are so giving of their time and patience a lot of the time. And obviously, you do get the paternity that are very dismissive. But actually, they're weakening their own position because none of us are going to last forever. And we need uh, enthusiasm not everyone passes through the university sort of pathway to get to where they are, but if they've got the enthusiasm and that can be channeled, then like with, with our rep, I've been working on it 15 years now, um, and I've yet to sit in a classroom to learn so much about archaeology, but with the right guidance, it's, it's achievable. Mm. And so you mentioned there about um, yeah, yeah, kind of passing on to the next generation, and I was wondering if, Ron, you could elaborate on that if you um, have any kind of ideas or plans to uh, kind of get the next generation involved? Well, Ali, Jenny, Mark, they're brilliant. They're helping us no end. We know what's on the seabed, the team, but we, we do not dive anymore because of age, medical conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we want to pass it on. We need divers, keen divers. And believe you me, there is a hell of a future for them down on the Salcom sites. Oh. Well, that's great to know that you haven't, that there's still lots of possibilities there. Um, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so one question is, if you could change one thing about the current system, what would it be as licensees? So Mark, do you want to go first? Oh, that's a difficult one, isn't it? I suppose <laughs> Sorry, I threw that at you, didn't I? <laughs> anything that just speeds up, because obviously there, there are hoops that we need to go through in order to protect the site, um, but allow visitors there. So anything that sort of speeds that up, uh, the paperwork side would be great. Um, we do live in an electronic age. So maybe if there's something where we can update um, some sort of web page or something almost instantaneously to add names, 
as as we have the authority to do so. But anything that also protects the site is something that needs to be carefully considered so that we don't then leave it to damage and misuse in the future. Um, with me, um, it's uh, NCR um, posts, um, Coast Guard stations overlooking the sites. For goodness sake, when they say or ring up and say, oh, there's a, there's a dive boat on or near your site, well, that's no good. We want a position fix uh, somehow uh, that they are committing an offence. We can't have boys on the site, but we need something else to aid the Coast Watch people. Uh, on, on, especially on our, on our, on our area, because we can never prosecute anybody mm. unless mm. fixed a boy or whatever. They're, they're two really good suggestions. And, um, yeah, it's great that we're getting this insight from you, um, who have, have obviously been doing this for decades. So thank you very much. Um, if there's any other final questions, we're just about to run out of time. Um, but thank you very much for sharing your experiences. And if anyone wants to, uh, join the the band of licensees and you've got a, two good examples here, then either get in touch with them directly or you can contact um, Nautical Archaeology Society or even Historic England directly and get involved with being a licensee. Uh, so it's great uh, to have this insight today. So thank you very much. Hopefully we can get some new recruits and that will be brilliant for uh, enthusing the next generation and also protecting our heritage in general, which is what we're all here about.